Empirical and molecular formulas. Empirical means lowest whole number ratio, such as for sodium chloride, magnesium nitrate, water. These are all unable to be reduced. The subscripts will all be in the lowest whole number ratio. A molecular formula may be lowest whole number ratio or might not be. H2O, for instance, is actually the molecule for water. Even though it's the lowest whole number ratio, this is the actual chemical formula. Sugar, on the other hand, glucose, C6H12O6, can be reduced. This is the actual molecule of glucose, but the empirical formula of glucose would be CH2O. That, however, is a completely different molecule, and it would be formaldehyde. So while this would be the molecular formula for formaldehyde, it is not the molecular formula for sugar, yet it is the empirical formula for sugar. Okay, so here's a problem. Let's practice with this one, uh, an ionic compound, and we'll determine the empirical formula for this compound and then name it. So now's a great time to pause the video and give this problem a try, or at the very least, get started on it. So you can see that we can take these percentages and just call them grams. By doing that, we're basically pretending that we have a 100 gram sample and that these percentages, instead of just being labeled as percent, are actually grams. That allows us to change grams to moles. So I guess it would be better if this had said that these are mole values. And uh, using the molar mass of each substance, sodium, and sulfur and the oxygen. Really helpful here to use uh, three significant figures, otherwise you may end up with not such nice, neat whole numbers. So then we will find the smallest mole value, which happens to be the sulfur, and divide each of the mole values by the smallest mole value and out come whole numbers. That will always, of course, make one of the values, the smallest one, mole value, will end up as a 1, and the rest of them will be hopefully whole numbers. We'll deal later in another problem if what happens if something were to come out to 2.5 or 4.3, how to deal with that. But for now, we end up with 2 sodium, 1 sulfur, 4 oxygens, which of course we will name sodium sulfate. Okay, here we have a hydrate problem. And hopefully you remember something about hydrates and realize that we are looking for, as you read the problem, we're looking for an anhydrate that contains iron, nitrogen, and oxygen. And then we're wondering how much water is attached to this. So that means we're looking for, it's a two-part problem. First, we have to figure out how much iron, how much nitrogen, how much oxygen is present in this anhydrate, and then how much water is actually part of the entire hydrate. So hopefully you gave it a shot and realized that the mass of iron is here, and the mass of uh, nitrogen, and then the oxygen. And these are molar masses that we're changing each of the elements into moles, which you see here. And then hopefully you remember that the trick to determining is to divide and first find the smallest of the mole values and divide that into each of the other mole values and that will always give you a value of one. If you don't get a one then you didn't choose the smallest value and hopefully you'll be getting whole numbers for the other elements. And so what is this one to three to six ratio FeN3O6. That doesn't look like any ionic compound that I'm familiar with. Hopefully you realize that you can extract a 3 and end up with N1O2, putting the 3 outside, which of course is iron 3 nitrite. Now on to the rest of the problem. We need to find out how much water. So we take the original mass of the hydrate and subtract the anhydrate value, and that will tell us how much water we'll need the molar mass of this anhydrate, 193.88, and of course you need the molar mass of water. 
So taking the anhydrate, turn it into moles. Taking the water mass value, turn that into moles. And again, divide by the smaller, which is the anhydrate, and usually will always be that. And so we end up with this 1 to 4 ratio, giving us the iron 3 nitrite tetrahydrate. Let's take a look at one more problem, this time determining the molecular formula. It doesn't actually ask explicitly in this problem to get the empirical formula, but that would have to be done first. Pause the video and give this problem a try if you're feeling confident. So as before, we need to take the mass of each element divide by the respective molar masses, which of course will give us moles of each of these substances. And then again, divide by the smallest mole value, which in this case is oxygen, resulting in 5 moles, 3.5 moles, and 1 mole. While certainly we don't need this 0 0.002, that's close enough to 5, you should not round this 3.5 down to 3 or up to 4. That should be a signal to multiply all of these mole values by 2, resulting in 10, 7, and 2, thus C10H7O2. But now, remember, we need the molecular formula for this compound. So we need the molar mass of the empirical formula, 10 carbons, 7 hydrogens, and 2 oxygens, resulting in 159. And given that the molar mass is approximately 318, 159 will divide into 318 twice implying that we need to drive this 2 through the empirical formula, resulting in C20H14O4.